So as usual, uh, please go to the tasks to complete for today. So you should all head to the Science 2 Canvas homepage. If you're looking for tasks for Unit 1, Lesson 10. This is U1L10. You can look under assignments or get on the homepage, scroll down to the uh, weekly calendar and look for today's date. Today is the 8th of October. You can see what I'm hoping to do today. As usual, first quick thing was to um, review the homework. Everyone feel good about their drawings of the moon phases? Hopefully that was kind of educational. I always think that's kind of interesting. Um, then you had the moon landings discussion. I've been seeing a lot of uh, good posts on there and we'll do a little discussion here in class based on that. Uh, and then observing the moon phases on Flipgrid, I haven't actually updated this, but I was seeing 10 responses. Uh, there are 16 people in the class, so um, if you have not done that yet, uh, please do so. If Flipgrid's giving you a hard time, you can always email me the video. Um, but I always think it's interesting because it's a great simulation to see exactly what's going on with the changing of the light on the moon. I always thought it was Earth's shadow that was causing the curved um, you know, change in light, but it has nothing to do with that. It's the rotation. And it's pretty mind-boggling that the same side of the moon is always facing us, right? And it's kind of a good simulation of that, um, that the rotation period of the moon matches perfectly its orbit around our planet. Um, otherwise, just make sure you've submitted your photos for topic number five and topic number six on the presentation notes. Looking like I've got submissions from most people on that, so that's good. Uh, I'll probably use some class time today too to check in with a few people who have a few things missing, but as always, please check under grades if anything's listed as missing. You want to get that in, especially as we're wrapping up our first unit. Um, you don't want to be making up work for the previous unit when we're starting our second unit, uh, which will be <laughs> starting uh, next week. Okay, the big thing for this class in particular is um, I've been checking the questions survey because um, we our next class meeting we're having our tests. And part of the test is questions that you submitted based on your presentations. And I'm missing questions from the following groups. Uh, Alex and Wiley, I need your questions on the sun. Uh, Lauren, Joyce, and Angel, I need your questions on the outer planets. Uh, Sophie, Flores, and Jessica, I need your questions on Earth's moon and eclipses. And then obviously today's presenters, Sophia and Emily, I need your questions on asteroids, comets, and dwarf planets. If you're not sure where to submit those, on the tasks to complete list, I'm gonna share my screen here real quick. Right on task number one, that last bullet point right there, right above the do now, make sure your group has submitted questions to the Science 2B Solar System Project Test Questions Google Form. Click on that. Again, I only need one group member to do that. So I need one multiple choice, one free response from you as a group. Uh, that's it. So uh, take some time to do that uh, soon. And uh, please list some fair questions. Um, my experience is you guys ask some hard questions uh, for your classmates to have to answer on a test. Uh, so I reserve the right to uh, edit those a little bit if need be. Um, but please fill out the four minutes in to entirety and uh, read the instructions carefully because there are some specific stuff you need to do. Okay, looks like we've got most of our stragglers in. So the do now, this is task number two. We're gonna do a couple speed meetings. Two questions that I want to throw at you. Um, as usual in your breakout room, say hi, check in with the person. Uh, but then I'd like you to share your answer to the two questions there. Um, we'll go one question at a time though. So round one relates to the homework. I'm going to throw the question in the chat here really quick. Here is the first thing you're going to share your answer to. After doing some research on the moon landings and reading at least one classmate's post, do you think the moon landings were faked or real? And what is the key evidence that convinced you? Give you about two minutes to discuss that and then we'll come back together to share. Rooms are open, go for it. a small rocky body orbiting the sun and large number of these ranging in size from nearly 600 miles, which is like 1000 kilometers um, across the planet series to dust particles are found as the asteroid belt, especially between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter through some having more 
um, different kinds of orbits and a few pass close to the Earth or enter the atmosphere as meteors. And some things you should know is that small asteroids are much more common than larger asteroids and they consist of metals and rocky materials and that most asteroids are found in space and are located in the asteroid belt. Thanks. And so Ceres is like a really big asteroid, right? Yeah. That's floating around. Cool. The one thing I'm always, I don't know, maybe you're going to mention this later. I'm, I'm always kind of saddened that um, this is actually very diffuse. You know, I'm so used to movies like Star Wars where they're, they're flying between the giant asteroids. And apparently that's not what it's like at all. It's, it's so spread out. It's, uh, you would never experience something like that. So I was like, oh, uh, how do we go forward here? Okay. And the next thing is that, um, meteors. And meteors are a small body of matter from outer space that enters the Earth's atmosphere, becoming incandescent due to the friction and appearing as a streak of light. And a few different kinds of meteors are meteorites. And meteorites are, if the, meteor, if the meteoroid is large enough, it can survive through the atmosphere, and then it can reach the surface of a plant in the moon. And Meteoroids, meteors, and meteorites are from asteroids, but can also be from comets. And about 200 tons of meteorites strike Earth each day. Smaller meteorites hit Earth more frequently than larger ones. And around every 10,000 years or so, there are like a large ones that come down to Earth and then they create larger craters. Nice. Yeah, often called uh, shooting stars, right? Even though they're not actually stars. That's a cool photo too. There's some people who go crazy collecting these and, and trying to find them. So right here is just a picture of um, demonstration of where the asteroids, meteorites, and meteors are. Um, and the meteoroids recite in space and meteors are in the atmosphere and meteorites are on the earth. Yeah, it's pretty funny how that terminology changes depending on location. <laughs> and the next thing is the Kuiper belt and that is a region of the solar system beyond the orbit of Neptune and believed to contain many comets, asteroids, and other small bodies made largely of ice. And it's like described as like a donut-shaped ring of millions of icy, rocky objects beyond the orbit of Neptune. And dwarf planet Pluto is the most well common, um, not most well common, but the most well-known one in the Kuiper Belt. And the Kuiper Belt is a cold area of the solar system. And the most crowded section of the Kuiper Belt is between 42 and 48 times Earth's distance from the sun and the orbit of objects in remain stable for the most part, but some objects occasionally have their um, course change slightly when they drift too close to Neptune. And scientists have yet to visit any planets located in the Kuiper Belt. I said, I think the, the pronunciation is Kuiper Belt. Kuiper um, Belt. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think some people might say it that way, Kuiper Belt, but yeah, I've heard it, Kuiper Belt. And the next thing is just the Oort Cloud, and this is a shell of com commentary bodies believed to surround the sun far beyond the orbits of the outermost planets, and from some are dislodged when perturbed. I can't pronounce it. Perturbed? Uh, where are we looking here? Uh, perturbed. Yeah, it just means bothered. Hit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perturbed. And over billions of years, this created a sphere of far out objects just barely held to our solar system. And we refer to this collection of far out objects as the Oort cloud. And the inner limits of the Oort cloud begin at 2000 AU from the sun. Nice. Yeah, and I think my understanding too is the reason they don't call it like um, a ring is because it's actually spherical. It kind of goes all the way around our, our solar system from, from what they know, I think. Oh, yeah, you're going to hit upon that. <laughs> and right here, these images just help like exhibit where the 
um, Cuper Bell is in relation to the Oort Cloud. Nice, yeah, it kind of shows the Oort Cloud being a more spherical, not a ring. Um, so now we're going to talk about dwarf planets. Um, so first I'm going to go over the definition, which is a celestial body resembling a small planet but lacking certain technical criteria that are required for it to be classed as such. Um, and dwarf planets are in the orbit of the sun. So when I say criteria, there's a lot of fluidity and fluidity and the definition is not something that's set in stone. And so um, I think that's something very important to keep in mind because um, these things are constantly changing. Um, but yeah, so here are some of the, well, generally the criteria for um, the celestial bodies to be considered as planet, planets. Um, so it must orbit a star in our cosmic um, neighborhood, such as the sun. Um, it must be big enough to have enough gravity to force it into a spherical shape. And it must be big enough that its gravity cleared, is cleared away in any other objects or similar size near its orbit around the sun. So there are currently five identified dwarf planets, make make Humea, Ceres, um, Aries and Pluto. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced them. No, um, that, was, that was good. Okay, good. <laughs> so the largest dwarf planet being Pluto and its size is relatively close to Aries um, and the smallest is Ceres. Um, an analogy that kind of puts into perspective the size of Aries is um, if the earth were the size of a nickel, um, Aries would be about, si about the size as a popcorn kernel so yeah I, I don't know I kind of use that like during my research because um with all these planets it can kind of get confusing like their order and like um just where they fall into the spectrum so yeah um and all Aries are considered trans objects or TNOs which are essentially um further than the sun and, further than the sun than Neptune um but yeah um and before we move on even further i just wanted to like give a brief oh wait next slide sorry <laughs> yeah the um uh if anyone's a fan of the expanse i don't know if it watches this a tv show on amazon it's a great book series too there's a human space station basically on series kind of a big thing there uh emily i'd also like to appreciate that you said uh these are not set in stone nice little pun there talking about planets made of stone maybe inadvertent but uh all right <laughs> Okay, um, this image gives context and is kind of like a brief overview of some of the topics like we've just reviewed before we um, uh, get out of that topic. So um, what I kind of want to focus on is what's on the bottom left corner. It kind of shows like the placement of the Oort cloud, Kuiper belt, and the sun. So how, uh, where the position is in relation to each other and the sun, um, which I think is pretty notable. Um, and yeah so. very cool image on the bottom too about how again people don't think about this but our, our sun is moving uh mm -hmm. and so all the planets that are orbiting around it are also moving that's a great diagram kind of showing the the path of uh of orbit mm -hmm. <laughs> okay okay so comets what is a comet a comet is a celestial object consisting of a nucleus of ice and dust and when near the sun a tall tip tail of gas and dust particles pointing away from the sun. Um, so in the next slide, I'll kind of go more in depth about like its physical characteristics, but um, just like a brief overview, it's composed of ice and dust um, and rock. Um, they can be observed in two regions, like hyperbelt um, and within the same as a solar system. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of like a true shooting star. You know, it looks like it's burning up in our atmosphere, but they last a lot longer. Um, because they're, uh, yeah, they're much further away. Nice. All right. Okay. Um, so now we're going to do like some comparisons. Um, early observations indicate a physical difference in comets and asteroids through the lens of the telescope. Um, it was noted that comets appear to be fuzzy while asteroids seem more point-like, which I thought was interesting to note how, um, I don't know how far we've kind of gone in terms of scientific um, exploration and just observation. 
Um, but the most significant distinction is perhaps the location of the two, um, which is described in the Venn diagram. Um, so the comets are primarily in two reservoirs, the Oort cloud or the region of TNOs or where the dwarf planets are basically, and asteroids res reside in the asteroid belt. Um, and it's interesting to know how, how like historically objects that were larger than 10 meters across have been called asteroids. So a lot of the times, I, I don't know, the terms are kind of interchangeable. Um, but yeah, so next, comets and meteors. Um, comets and meteors consist of, both consist of ice, rock, and dust. Um, and when a meteor enters the Earth's atmosphere, it begins to burn and creates a trail of light owing to the air, versus, air resistance it encounters. Um, a comet remains in space while a meteor uh, reaches the Earth's atmosphere. So essentially, a comet is a shooting star in space, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, and again, just like you were doing before, good terminology in that uh, you can see it's a meteoroid when it's in space, meteor when it's burning up in our atmosphere, meteorite when it's hit the ground. <laughs> Very technical, but interesting. So um, now it's kind of like near asteroids and meteor slash meteor impact. Um, like I said, asteroids and meteors, that's like these terms, two terms are kind of interchangeable. So, um, Okay, near asteroids are a lot more common than you may realize, and um, I don't know. It's just I feel like a lot of people don't really pay too much, pay too close of attention to it. Um, but even myself, before doing research, I overlooked it. But um, after everything, I, I I don't know. I found like a newfound interest in it. But yeah, so a hundred tons of space um, impacts the Earth every day. However, evidently, unfortunately, they're not large enough to create extensive damage, and um, the vast majority fall unnoticed in uninhabited areas. Um, but several times a year, a few land in places that catch more attention. So on this slide, we have listed the most recent encounter, which is actually which was actually September twenty fourth of this year, um, and it didn't collide with Earth, obviously, but um, it did reach the surface so um and it's been it was the closest it's ever been so um i have a video on the side and it's sort of like a countdown but if you start it it should be it start like at the 22nd mark cool yeah from i know they got good images um of it mm -hmm. so this is the uh the 2020 sw asteroid uh, passing by mm -hmm. well it you can see it at like the one second mark, but. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah I guess and that, that white line is Earth's orbit, I guess. Yeah, if you like um, do full screen, you could kind of see. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see work. Earth is in relation to the moon and how close the asteroid was. Um, yeah, here, let me back it up just one second here. Oh, okay, I, I see. Yeah. yeah. There's Earth. Nice. Okay. And then there are two sort of atmospheric, I guess. Right. Oh, sorry. No, no, before. <laughs> okay. Um, and both of them, I didn't realize this, nor did I do it intentionally, but um, both of them were in Russia. And the first one isn't necessarily like um, definitively a co like a comet or asteroid that exploded onto Earth. It's just believed to be just because there's like um, this massive explosion in Russia in 1908. And so, especially then, it we probably didn't we, we weren't technical technologically advanced enough to i guess really look into that thoroughly so even now there isn't really a definitive definitive answer or like whether or not it was an asteroid or a comet but um i don't know i still thought it was noteworthy just because again you never know oh, but, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the most recent one 
I looked up the name, so hopefully I say it right, but Shelia Binsk, I think that's how you say it, but that was the most modern one, I guess you could say. And um, there aren't really like pictures of it directly impacting like earth but you could definitely see like the smoke and um i guess it coming into it or like the aftermath um so this happened in 2013 in russia and if you go to the next slide there's a video of reactions or kind of how like the aftermath looked nice yeah and you're the tunguska event too there are some uh, old photos of the it incinerated like whole forests and stuff um, that's, that's kind of evidence a lot of people look at, but okay, uh, here's the, uh, Russians looked at the sky in fear and amazement as a fireball lit up the early morning sky. Reports from Russia indicate that the fireball was caused by one or more meteorites. Witnesses reported feeling a shockwave and others reported broken windows and other possible damage. Hello. Andrei, hello. Yeah. Да, не, не, все нормально, давай. В подъезд заходишь, с правой стороны сразу стоит. There's, uh, there's actually a lot of um, for NBC news there's a lot of dash cam footage you can find often uh, of that of it actually burning through the atmosphere too and kind of the shockwave that it created um, if you hop on YouTube so nice thank you um, so sorry okay asteroid mining so asteroid mining is the exploration of raw materials from asteroids and other minor planets um, including near-Earth objects, hard rock minerals could be mined from an asteroid or a spent comet. And I have another video actually which kind of goes in depth and I feel like um, and shows its value and yeah. Cool. Here we go. Ah, casually watching a video on YouTube on a computer. Should we watch like the first like minute or like how long do we want to go? Yeah, there's a stop mark on it, I believe. Oh, okay, cool. It's more powerful than anything humanity could build a few decades ago. This progress and all the wonderful machines you take for granted are built on a few rare and precious materials with names like terbium, neodymium, or tantalum. Getting these rare materials from the, gro oh. the ground into your devices is ugly. The mining industry is responsible for air and water pollution and the destruction of entire landscapes. Dangerous chemicals like cyanide, sulfuric acid or chlorine are used to extract the resources, harming biodiversity, workers and locals. And rare resources are also political tools when countries restrict access to them to get their way. But what if we could replace the mining industry on Earth with a clean process that can't harm anyone? Well, we can. All we need to do is look up. Asteroids are millions of trillions of tons of rocks, metals and ice, leftovers from the cloud that became the planet 4.5 billion years ago. They can be as small as a meter or protoplanets the size of entire countries. Most of them are concentrated in the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt, while hundreds of thousands more do their own thing between the planets. As space travel is becoming more feasible, scientists and economists have begun looking at the resources found in these asteroids. Even relatively small metallic asteroids may contain trillions worth of industrial and precious metals like platinum. And bigger asteroids like 16 Psyche could contain enough iron nickel to cover the world's metal needs for millions of years. At current market prices, the rare raw materials alone would be worth quadrillions of dollars. Well, not really, but technically. For example, there are more than 20 million tons of gold in the ocean's water worth roughly 750 trillion US dollars. But filtering out the gold would be so expensive that you'd lose money selling it. Right now, asteroid mining has exactly this problem. It's too expensive to replace mining on Earth. Billions of dollars worth of valuable resources in space are worthless if it costs trillions to get them. What makes it so hard? The principles behind mining an asteroid are simple. 
The basic idea is to choose an asteroid, move it to a place where it's easy to process, and then take it apart to turn into useful products. Unfortunately, all of this collides with fundamental problems humans have yet to solve. Going to space is expensive. It costs thousands of dollars in rocket fuel for each kilogram just to reach a low Earth orbit. Going further out into deep space costs thousands more. We need cheaper... So that's kind of like oh, around around. casually nice. Sorry. Uh, of what asteroid mining is. So um, initially it might sound like science fiction. I know it did to me at first, but asteroid mining is theoretically possible. And studies have also suggested that asteroid mining is very clean and would be pro very profitable, uh, profitable considering the abundance of resources and even untold riches. Um, personally, it feels almost too good to be true but would be amazing if it was properly executed and was deemed safe for the environment um uh i think it would lead to further space space ex exploration so um at the same time we'd be profiting and exploring which is like a win-win um but as the video suggests it is extremely expensive and could cost us more than what we would gain um, but I feel like a potential solution may be using electrical spaceships rather than the generic rocket ship, which requires much fuel. Um, but the only downside to that would be that electrical spaceships don't really, they can't really get as far as the regular rocket ship. So um, once in space, I, I think you'd have to go to the nearest planet. You wouldn't really have time for that exploration aspect. Um, but yeah, so um, this is constantly being um, in the discoveries, basically, in regards to it. And um, if it is um, properly ex executed, I think that it would be a really um, profitable, profitable um, and beneficial and all um, just thing to do. Yeah, definitely a motivator, all that money. And yeah, leave it to the SpaceX. They'll probably figure something like this out. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's all. Thank you for listening. Great. All right. Let's have everybody unmute. Round of applause. Final presentation done. Very good job. Any questions or comments on asteroids, dwarf planets, and so on? That was great. We had really good videos in there too. Um, I love that on that <laughs> asteroid mining, they showed the the rocket taking off. Anyone notice there was money burning up in the back of it because <laughs> it's too expensive to, to launch? I thought that was funny. Um, and good point about the news in terms of what they pay attention to. Like there are constantly um, asteroids and comets that are usually passing pretty close to Earth or, or within our path. And um, yeah, most of the time the news doesn't pay attention, except I feel like every once in a while you hit like a slow news cycle and then suddenly you start hearing about all these asteroids because it's like they're looking for something to report on. Um, it's pretty interesting, so. Um, all right, so please everyone make sure you are submitting a photo of your notes to the topic number seven presentation notes. Um, and that is it. So groups that I mentioned at the start of class, please make sure you've submitted your test questions as well to that Google form. And since we've wrapped up the solar system presentations, anyone know what we're gonna do the next time we meet? Yes. I mean, we are taking our test. So I wanna walk you through how this is gonna work in science too, because uh, this is kind of our first big assessment. Um, where's my, where's my uh, what on earth? Sometimes it does this with the, uh, oh, there it is. Uh, problem is I went to full screen. There we go. Okay. So on the tasks to complete list, on the very bottom, uh, I want you to go look there. I have, uh, as part of the homework, study for unit one, Big Bang and Solar System test. You'll notice there's a link to a study guide and review slides. Um, the study guide is a Word document or a Google document I pulled together um, that kind of breaks down what the test will cover. It's gonna be a 75 to 100 point test on Canvas. It's entirely open notes. I'm not gonna try to control anything. You can look at your notebook, you can, Look at the review sides. You can look at this study guide. You can hop on Google if you really need to. I'm not going to try to control any of that stuff. 
Um, it's going to cover the Big Bang from Hewitt chapter 29.7, solar system stuff from chapter 28, including all the presentation stuff and the questions you submitted, and then a little bit of Hewitt chapter 5 on gravity. And I kind of break down each of the topics there in this study guide. I have links to digital versions of the readings. I also have links to videos that I used to review slides related to those topics. So you got lots of resources here to refer to in preparing for the test. Um, the review slides are all the class slides that I use, just melded together. So it starts off with the Big Bang, works through some solar system stuff, and ends with gravity. You can also access all of these solar system presentation slides on the discussion board on Canvas. So if you want to go back and look through some of those, you can do that. But all of that is there for you to refer to to help you prepare and feel confident on the first assessment. Any questions on how the first test is going to work? Emily? I have a question. Oh, sorry. I saw it. Emily, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was just going to ask about the formatting and also how long we have to complete. So we'll start off class, we'll use the class period. We'll start off class with a little bit of review and then I don't set a strict time limit. Um, so ideally you're done at the end of class, um, but for anyone who needs extra time, it won't cut you off at any point. So you can take as much time as you need. Mm -hmm. Sophie Flores? Um, can we like send each other our Google Slides? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, that's what the, I mean, you can send each other the Google slides, the discussion board on canvas. That's the point of that is that you all have access to that. You should be able to click on each other's links, but yes, you can send each other your um, slides as well. And you know, you know what questions you posted too. So you can point people towards those specific slides um, or anything like that. Uh, and Emily, in terms of the format, it'll be kind of a little bit of multiple choice, some free response, and then some more kind of, um, there'll probably be a flip grid thing. Um, where you're taking a video of yourself doing something, demonstrating something, um, all related to classwork we've done so far. Any other questions on the assessment? Okay, um, we technically have five minutes left in class, and so I'm going to let the gravity um, activity we were going to do just be homework. It's actually super fast anyway. Um, what I intended to do was to have you quickly review the relationship between mass and distance with gravity using this um, FET simulator. Uh, you might have used FET simulations in the past. There's a short quiz on Canvas for you to complete. Again, you can do that as homework. It's literally, I think, four multiple choice questions. It'll take you less than five minutes. Um, but take a look at this little diagram here on the screen, and you'll notice, everyone see that we've got force on mass one by mass two, so that's a gravitational force, 33.4 newtons, and then force on mass two by mass one, 33.4 newtons. What happens to the gravitational force when I move them further apart? What do you notice? Did it go up or down? Is it going up or down? Look at the Newton number. As we increase distance, what happens to gravitational force? Goes down. It is going down. And we call that an inverse relationship, right? Uh, these things make funny sounds, but now they're closer. Uh, so you can see the shorter the distance, the higher the gravitational force, the greater the distance, the lower the gravitational force. Okay, what about mass? Watch what happens if I increase the mass uh, for mass two. What's happening to the gravitational force? It's going up. It is going up. That is a direct relationship, right? The larger the mass, the more the gravitational force, which makes sense because planet Earth, which is absolutely massive compared to us, um, you can feel its gravity, right? Well, the reason we fall back to fall down is because Earth is pulling us towards its center. Um, but you're also exerting gravity on Earth, and you're exerting gravity on everything around you, including the computer you're sitting in front of. But the reason your computer isn't moving towards you is because our mass is pretty insignificant compared to something like the entire planet, um, which has more of an effect on us. So, um, so you can uh, use this FET simulation to complete that quiz on Canvas. Uh, but otherwise, homework is just making sure that you uh, do that uh, and you've submitted all of your notes, photos, your test questions, and, um, and study for the test. So on that note, um, I know we technically still have four minutes left in class, but I'm going to conclude things. However, I am going to ask the groups that have not submitted questions yet to stay and at least confirm with me that you're going to do that. So Alex, Wiley, Lauren, Joyce, Angel, Jessica, Sophie Flores, Sophia Eddington, and Emily, if you could hang out um, just to confirm with me your questions. Otherwise, uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Have a good day to the rest of you.